Good afternoon and welcome to the joint hearing with the Committee on Judiciary and Finance. I would like to welcome Chair Pearson and the members of the Finance Committee today. It is Monday, May 17th, and I'd like to call this meeting to order. Will the clerk please take roll call attendance for each of the committees, please, beginning with Judiciary. Chairwoman Coyne. Here. Senator Archambault. Present. Senator Reptakis. Present. Senator Burke. Present. Senator Oyer. Present. Senator Lombardi. Senator Casada. Senator Rogers. Yeah. You have six members present. There's a quorum. Thank you. Chairman Pearson. Here. Senator De Palma. Senator Felag. Present. Senator Paolino. Here. Senator Acosta. Present. Senator Cano. Senator Chacon. <coughs> Senator Murray. Present. Senator Seventy. Here. And seven, Senator Sosnowski. You have six members present. Thank you. Uh, today we will be hearing Senate Bill numbers 248, 394, 399, 400, 542, and 772, mostly related to corrections, and also Senate Bill 539, as well as Article 13, Sections 1 through 4 and 7. Um, entitled Probation and Parole of the Budget Relating to the Department of Corrections FY 2021 Supplemental and FY 2022 Budgets. So it really did make perfect sense to hold a joint meeting with the Committee on Finance. With that said, and in keeping with existing virtual protocol for this committee, I would ask for a motion to hold the seven bills before the Committee on Judiciary for further study. May I have a motion to hold these bills made by Senator Oyer, seconded by... Senator Archambault, Mr. Clerk, may I have a roll call vote, please? Madam Chair. Yes. Senator Archambault. Yes. Senator Reptakis. Yes. Senator Burke. Yes. Senator Oyer. Yes. And Senator Rogers. Yes. There are six in the affirmative and none in the negative. Thank you. The vote is unanimous and the bills are held for further study. Before we begin sponsored testimony related to any of the judiciary bills this afternoon, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Chair uh, Pearson for opening remarks and the presentation on this uh, budget article. Uh, I would also like the public to know uh, that uh, upon conclusion of the presentation on the Committee on Finance side, we will take public testimony and then we will move to the agenda for Committee on Judiciary. Thank you. And with that, Chair Pearson. Thank you so much, uh, Chairman McCoyne. Uh, great to be here today with you and the members of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, we are going to be hearing today uh, on House Bill 6122, a.k.a. the budget, uh, Articles 13, Sections 1 through 4 and 7, related to probation and parole forms, uh, and also the Department of Corrections uh, Fiscal 21 Supplemental and Fiscal 2022 uh, budgets. Uh, with us today from the administration, we have Director Wilmer uh, with OMB, and also I see Director Coyne uh, at the Department of Corrections, as well as Laura Pizzatoro uh, with the Parole Board. Um, Director Wilmer, I will uh, turn over to you to begin the administration's uh, presentation and then introduce uh, those individuals here on behalf of the administration today. Thank you, Chairman, uh, members of the committee. It's very, very nice to be here in a, a joint committee. Uh, we have a number of people from the administration that are uh, here to present, and we have a, a short um, uh, slide deck that we'd like to share with you. I'm going to start sharing my screen. And turn it over to... Director Coin Fag to begin the presentation. Thank you, uh, Director Walmer. Um, good evening, members of the uh, Senate Finance and Senate Judiciary Committees, uh, Chairperson Coyne and Chairperson Pearson. Um, I just wanted to take a moment before I start going through this deck to introduce the people that I have with me tonight. Um, Brenda Broder is our CFO. She's here with me, as well as the Three assistant directors. Can you hear me? We can. Huh? We can, yes. hear, you, we can hear you, director. Um, three assistant directors. Uh, assistant director for administration, uh, Wayne Salisbury. Assistant director for rehab services, Barry Weiner. 
and Assistant Director for Institutions and Operations, Ruby Denise. I also have our Medical Program Director, Dr. Justin Burke, here. Um, and they're all here tonight in case there are particular questions uh, within their areas of subject matter expertise, and, and I would turn it over to them if that happens. Um, so without further ado, the now Jonathan, you're controlling this, right? So I think I want to jump right to slide four, if you can, please. It's like a lot of title pages. <clears throat> right. So this uh, slide just shows what happened to our population to provide some context um, as a result of COVID-19. Because of the, um, the, you know, the, what happened in, in our state in terms of um, businesses and, and movement and um, basically during the two-week pause, but even before that, when people were quarantined, uh, we saw a significant impact to both incoming commitments as well as our sentence population. Uh, and you can see through the, the, the red line is sentenced and the blue line is the awaiting trial. Um, that there was a steady decline in both of those populations during really the, the height of the pandemic. Um, we have seen those numbers starting to creep back up. They're not back to pre-pandemic levels yet. Um, not sure when that might happen, but uh, there was a pretty significant decline. And this had nothing to do with releasing people. This was just a, a, a function of you know, really law enforcement prioritizing and, and triaging those kinds of cases that really absolutely needed to result in someone coming to the ACI as opposed to having people bailed out at the, at the station and so forth, as well as the judiciary really um, being encouraged to set bail when they could set bail and to think about setting bail uh, in cases where they, they might not have um, but for the pandemic. And so that's why you see our population had declined. Next slide. Jonathan. <laughs> Try here. I don't know why it won't. Hmm. Hey, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, and so obviously we, we had um, our own particular impacts uh, with regard to COVID-19, having a congregate population. We unfortunately had two inmates pass away from COVID and we tragically had one staff member, a correctional officer, Lieutenant Freeman, pass away from COVID, um, which is awful, but compared to other states is uh, actually a, a very low number. Um, we are fourth from the bottom in terms of uh, inmate fatalities from COVID in the nation and among unified systems, which we are, we have a jail and, and the prisons, um, the only unified system that uh, had better outcomes than us was Vermont. Um, these bullets are just some um, uh, things we, we are proud of. Uh, rightfully so, that uh, in terms of vaccination in particular, um, we have become a model for other states in terms of our vaccination acceptance rate among both inmates and staff. We have a very high rate of vaccination among inmates and staff. Um, right now, we uh, have only one symptomatic case of COVID-19 or had in, in this year. Um, and that doesn't include new commitments. Sometimes people will come in with COVID uh, and they're quarantined, but we're, we're, I'm not counting them in that number. Um, the only COVID-related hospitalization in 2021, to my knowledge, has been a staff member. There have been none uh, in the inmate population. And thanks to a lot of hard work by a lot of people and led by Dr. Burke, um, we've been able to successfully use the, the monoclonal antibody treatment among inmates. Uh, and have that for the future if needed. We have a very robust testing program and we are at the point now where we are starting to slowly reopen things like programming, in-person visits. Uh, we expect in the next couple of weeks to reinstitute work release 
um, and we are we are conscientiously doing or consciously doing uh, kind of one thing at a time in the event that then we see an outbreak we know what it's from and we can dial it back um, but so far uh, we've been we've been successful and and I would anticipate that uh, life here is is starting to really get back to pre-pandemic normal next slide So, yep, yeah, I went a little too far. Six, page six. There you go. Thank you. So, this is just an overview uh, of the of the uh, FY22 recommended budget. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory, but it does include a request for 13 new FTEs, full-time equivalent positions. Um, and I can explain and will explain a little bit further on. Uh, about each of those and, and what they mean, how, they, how they're important. Um, and so we're just asking for an increase of 13 positions and I'll, and I'll go into a little more detail in a bit on those. Uh, next slide. So one of the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the proposed um, savings is related to closure of mods. Um, as I'm sure you know, at this point, we don't save a significant amount of money by releasing uh, just a couple of inmates from a module. The real savings come if you can actually close a housing mod. Um, you'll save per diem cost, but you won't really save where the money is, which is in staffing, unless you close a mod. And so we had anticipated uh, savings based on mod closures. In this past year, we have done everything we can to spread out our population as much as we can within all of our mods in order to keep people as distant as we can, which is certainly a challenge in um, a correctional setting. Uh, and now that, you know, the bulk of our population is vaccinated and uh, our numbers are actually very, very low, we're starting to look, especially in light of the fact that our population has decreased so much, we're starting to look at our ability to consolidate populations and uh, close some mods. And so that's, you know, this um, proposed savings assumes that we're going to be able to do that. Uh, overtime savings that has to do with an absenteeism initiative. The Department of Corrections, like, like some of the other 24-7 operations in state government, uh, frankly, has a very high level of absenteeism, um, much of which is excused and legitimate, uh, and um, we don't have an issue with it. Um, but some of it is, is um, we suspect, we more than suspect, is not uh, legitimate. And our system for addressing those that would abuse their sick leave uh, was ineffective. And so we designed a new system to address that. Was, we're in the process of kind of putting that into to, uh, practice when the pandemic hit. Um, everything got put on pause not just because of the pandemic, but also because of an unfair labor practice action that the Rhode Island Brotherhood of Correctional Officers filed that we had to litigate. And so we've kind of had to table this initiative uh, until that was resolved. We are awaiting a decision from the labor board on that issue. Um, and we have reinstituted our absenteeism tracking system, which we had paused during the pandemic. We're very grateful uh, that, you know, People stayed home when they didn't feel well, which is what we told them to do during the pandemic, obviously. Uh, but we're also very grateful that, that everyone else came to work. Uh, and there's been an awful lot of uh, uh, involuntary overtime done by our staff here, and, and, and we would not be able to run the place without it. And I'm very grateful to the staff for doing that. Um, however, those that would abuse the system need to be effectively dealt with and we anticipate that once we're able to do that we will be able to save the state a significant amount of money the elimination of temporary clerical services um, it has to do with admin support functions uh, and so there um, we're challenged by the fact that sometimes we we don't have the luxury of leaving those positions vacant depending on the unit that the person works in for example data entry in our records and id unit or in a probation and parole office but there is um there is an opportunity to to um eliminate the use of those services in some areas and that's why we anticipate savings in those areas next slide please director before you um move to the opioid uh, stewardship if you don't mind i just want to jump and ask a couple questions on the over on the overview there 
Um, sure. Taking a look just at the, and, and this may be a director role more question as well, but looking at the FY22 sort of proposed uh, revenue sources, um, it appears federal funds are, you know, moving themselves back down to probably a, you know, more consistent or stable dollar, right, from 53 million to, you know, 125 down to about, about 2 million there. Is that is that 2 million sort of pre-COVID standard of federal funds that would have came in? Or are we still anticipating in fiscal 2022 20, using some uh, federal funds that, you know, were Rescue Plan or CARES Act dollars, et cetera? So I, I guess we'll start uh, on that question, although um, the CFO from Corrections might want to back me up on what's historically reflective for um, uh, uh, federal funds. So the the previous a couple of stimulus bills a, a, ago. So it's it's a little bit hard to keep track of all the different stimulus bills that have come come through. But an eligible use of the Corona Relief Fund was to uh, fund salaries uh, for public safety and public health. And under the presumption that all public safety and public health helped contribute um, uh, to the the pandemic fight. Uh, that is not a, uh, a criteria that seems to be in the um, American Rescue Plan um, uh, stimulus bill that more recently passed in the Biden administration and guidance came out on, um, or well, initial preliminary guidance came out on middle of last week. So uh, I would not anticipate any uh, significant spending on public health and public safety uh, like we did with uh, CRF. And I, I don't know, if, so the 2.2 that we're seeing there, is that just standard? What's that 2.2 there? Is that pre-COVID money we're getting from the feds for something related to corrections? I'd, I'd, I'd defer to the, the um, the, uh, the CFO from Corrections, if she can answer that, or if uh, if one of my staff is on it, that knows the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. That is correct. That is what we would um, remain to keep in the department pre-COVID. The majority of those funds are for SCAP, which is a reimbursement for undocumented aliens. That's about a million dollars. And the rest is more is for educational federal rewards that we receive. Okay, thank you. Um, and then taking a look at the RICAP funding of $5.1 um, do we expect that, and this might be a direct normal question, do we expect that to remain constant even after the RICAP amendment that we'll probably receive, I think, in the next couple of weeks? Uh, yes. We, we don't expect um, much to change the RICAP amendment. In fact, we expect so little to change. We're having a debate about whether it's worth submitting an amendment at all. Um, and then just related to the new positions, I know seven, the seven discharge planning positions, I know, um, Director Coyne, thanks for, for chatting with us about those earlier in the year. Um, when that sort of comes through, those seven positions, is it is it basically a wash around the cost of those positions versus the prior outside con outside services contract or? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. okay. Are there any other questions from any members of the committees on sort of the general budget before we proceed through? Yeah, I'm going, Mr. Chairman. Senator Seventy. Thanks. Um, I, I, my question is, I'm, I'm still looking at this overtime uh, personnel savings slide, and uh, I, my question is, how, how many shifts in a in a in a row can uh, can one of uh, one of your employees work these days? I'm sorry, did you get that? We heard sorry. you. Sorry. Sorry, I was muted. Um, uh, correctional officers by contract are allowed to elect to work four shifts in a row. So 32 hours at a stretch. Right. Okay. I mean, we talked about this a couple of years ago. I thought this was going to somehow get resolved. Aren't there safety issues and performance issues associated with that kind of a schedule? So you're right. Um, we would love to see this resolved. It's um, unfortunately a matter that's permitted by contract, and so it needs to be resolved in contract negotiations. Some years ago, believe it or not, the number was five shifts that they could elect to work in a row. And that was changed to four 
um, at some point before my time, before I got here. Um, I do view it as a safety issue. I do view it as a performance issue. Um, I will tell you that I cannot, as I sit here, point to any, and fortunately, any tragedy or horrible occurrence that I can draw a straight line between that occurrence and officers uh, working quads. Um, but to me, I shouldn't have to wait until something terrible like that happens. Um, I, I think it's um, unrealistic to expect anyone in any profession to be sharp after that many hours in a row. That said, the reality is that if I did not have officers willing to work quads, I would have a lot of difficulty keeping the department staffed um, appropriately. Well, that's, you know, that's kind of a, um, that's an organizational indictment in itself, I guess. Uh, when's, the, when's, the, uh, when's the contract coming up to be negotiated? I believe negotiations are starting uh, now. Um, that the, uh, my understanding is the coalition had met, and I don't know if RIBCO is part of that, but RIBCO has uh, traditionally negotiated separately from the coalition of all of the, everyone else, basically all the other unions. Um, and so we take our cues from the Department of Administration, which usually contracts with someone to, to lead those negotiations. And so we would expect them to be starting up soon. So uh, so, by, so this particular question, uh, I'm, I'm assuming, is, is on your list to deal with? Much so, yes. Okay, all right, thanks. I'm, I'm finished, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Any other questions or comments from members of the committee? Mr. Chairman. Senator Cano. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just want to make a comment. Is um, is just for to make sure that uh, moving forward, when we talk about undocumented uh, people, we don't refer as them as aliens. And I know it's probably something that it was a slip. I just want to make sure that. Uh, for the context of the presentation in the state government, we just don't refer as alien as they um, don't feel is the appropriate term. Um, so I just wanted to make that comment. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator. Are there any other questions or comments from members of the committee? Okay. All right, Director, sorry to interrupt you there. Um, we can uh, maybe pick up on slide eight on the opioid fund. Thank you. So the... Um, Oh, I need Jonathan to forward the slide, please. Thank you. So the opioid stewardship fund investments, that's um, that's federal uh, fed restricted, receipt. restricted receipt funds um, it, that would allow us to engage medication-assisted treatment for all commitments um, who uh, come to us suffering from opioid use disorder. Rhode Island has been a leader nationwide in this area with our sentence population and this would allow us to augment that to uh, deal with more of our new commitment population. Uh, next slide. Senator Archambault okay, has a question. Hi, Director. If, if you go back to the opioid steward fund investment, stewardship fund investment, would you give us just a uh, general overview as to how that'll work in conjunction with Kodak, just for those who don't know how it works. An inmate comes in, they've got an opioid addiction. How will it work in the management? I mean, you don't have to go ad nauseum, but if you could just give an overview of how that will work practically, I'd appreciate it. Sure. Sure. Uh, thank you, Senator. So we have a contract with Kodak, as you know. Uh, we have a longstanding relationship with them. Inmates would be assessed for um, medication-assisted treatment and, and assessed for their uh, ability or appropriateness to participate in the program. And I do have a medical director behind me, and if any, if any point I say something wrong, just throw something at me. Um, uh, they are assessed for their appropriateness to participate and their willingness to participate in the medication-assisted treatment program, and then uh, an assessment of what's, what of the array of choices in terms of that medication makes the most sense to them. Rhode Island was the first prison system in the country to use all three of those options, three different types of medication-assisted treatment. They become a patient of Kodak then and there. So when they are released, they are already in Kodak system. When they can go to Kodak to continue with their medication-assisted treatment, 
Um, and that's why we believe um, it's a, it's a um, that's part of why it's been so successful is because they're, they're, there's already that uh, enrollment before they even get out. And so that when they get out, they can go to Kodak and continue with that treatment. This will allow us to treat um, new com more new commitments than we were previously able to do. Uh, thank you. Just one more follow-up question from Senator Archibald. Yeah, thank you, Director. Really, even just, just a comment. You had a gem in there of a... Somebody slammed the door. You had a gem in there of accomplishment, and uh, you're being very humble. I don't want you to skip over that. I'm proud of that. That's great. And to know that they're linked up with Kodak and they can heal and it cut down the rate of recidivism, it's a great accomplishment for Rhode Island. I didn't know we led the country in that, too. That's kudos to you and A.T. Wall before you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Director, just on, on uh, and this might be a director, one more question as well, but I, you know, just reading through this, the $2.3 million in, in the stewardship funding, um, I'm seeing, you know, we've got 714, which were to supplant costs covered by general revenue previously, 847 for expansion, and then on the substance use disorder, there's 700,000 um, from the fund. I guess my question was around the, the opiate stewardship fund dollars were net incremental dollars um, that were added after we had passed the president's uh, legislation on this, kind of sort of creating the fund and, and creating the taxation to get at it. I guess what I'm trying to understand of, of a mix from the fund is how much of the fund are we using to supplant prior general revenue obligations versus how much of the fund are we using for net new incremental um, investments uh, to tackle the substance abuse issue? Uh, so that's a good question. I, we, are, we are expanding. Most of it is being used for expansion. Um, we are planning a, uh, a full accounting of the entire opioid stewardship fund when we do the BHDDH budget presentation. Uh, but if you'd like that sooner, we can, we can get you a, a full accounting uh, okay. before that hearing. Okay. Yeah, no, that'd be great. It's, it's come up a couple, couple times internally, so um, would be would be good to get an eye on that as soon as it's ready. Um, and then I know we'll be working to, to reschedule BHDDH anyway. Okay. That'd okay. be fine. Sorry again, Director, we'll let you maybe pick up on slide nine on, on healthcare investments. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. So under healthcare investments, um, we are requesting additional FTEs in our healthcare services program. Um, one thing that has, you know, it's always been a challenge, frankly, um, but the past year of dealing with a, a, a pandemic inside the walls of the ACI have, have merely served to highlight, highlight the need for um, an appropriate level of staff and the right medical staff to do, do the things that we need them to do. We have a very um, uh, high need population. These are generally not individuals that have taken good care of themselves before they came into our custody. Uh, and then as the population ages, uh, we become more and more challenged by their medical needs. The, uh, the four FTEs will build our capacity to just do a, do a better job at intervening, um, at, at being more efficient about our, um, our resources, hopefully cut down on ER trips, hospital trips. The, the money, if you will, in an ER trip or a hospital stay for an inmate is not in the medical care, it's in the custody costs. And so anything that we can do to, um, I mean, there are medical costs, obviously, but anything we can do to, to bring those those officer custody costs down by providing that care within the walls uh, is, is, um, makes a lot of financial sense. The second piece on this slide has to do with a, um, isn't this a capital request? Not a capital request, no. Um, with an investment for um, creation of a unit that, we, that we're calling a TCU or a transitional care unit, which will help service inmates with significant persistent mental illness, SPMI, um, at a lower level than our current unit, the RTU, which is the residential treatment unit. The residential treatment unit exists at high security um, to, to work closely and intensively with inmates in a program of about six months in length who cannot function in general population because of SPMI. Uh, and it's, it's actually done very well in, in servicing those inmates and getting them to the point that they can live safely in population. 
we are currently in the midst of federal litigation, which has highlighted the need for a transitional care unit, kind of a in between the RTU and general population. And so that's what those funds are related to. Uh, the next uh, two um, bullets relate to those other FTE requests, and it has to do with the development of an ACI apprenticeship program and a partnership with DLT. These are uh, both initiatives that uh, it's one FTE each, and it's all part of a, an effort that we are engaged in to provide educational and vocational training to inmates that is relevant to today's job market and that also serves to link inmates with employers on the outside who are willing to work with them and willing to hire them post-release, but establishing those relationships while the inmates are still incarcerated. Um, this is something that, that other states have done very well and have, done, uh, have had a lot of success with. Uh, and so it's something that I would, I'd like to see Rhode Island replicate. We know that uh, having a job and having a, a, a meaningful job that allows people to provide for their families is a major, if not the number one, contributor to recidivism reduction. It keeps people from coming back. Um, I, I view it as central to our mission of rehabilitation to try to do everything we can to give people the tools to, to be able to find that meaningful work, to be able to learn how to um, Learn, learn those skills that are, that are going to make them competitive in today's job market. And so that's what these two um, FTEs relate to and the allocation of money relate to them. We are working with DLT uh, and also Real Jobs Rhode Island um, in terms of structure in, in developing this program. But it's something that um, I think is really important and could be really uh, beneficial for Rhode Island. The next has to do with the uh, transfer of discharge planning in-house. This was a recommendation from 2017 from the Harvard Kennedy School, uh, and it's something that's that uh, I think it was uh, Chairman Pearson said it's it's frankly basically a wash between the cost of the um, new FTEs and the contracts that we used to uh, spend money on for discharge planning. By moving these um, positions in-house and having state employees do them rather than contracted services, we have a lot more continuity. We have a, a much higher quality of, of discharge planning because of that continuity. Um, discharge planners work with inmates prior to their release um, on everything from finding a job to enrolling in Medicaid to um, seeking housing and so forth, all things that are major contributors to recidivism reduction. Um, and, and our discharge planners uh, have the contacts in the community and the community agencies to do that handoff so when they are released that they're, in, in, they're positioned uh, in the best possible way to be successful uh, post-release and not come back to incarceration. We found that with our contracts, um, there was a lot of turnover in those agencies. The agencies struggled with funding, which led to cuts. Um, and the, and that, kind of, that level of turnover did not lend itself well to really providing a, a meaningful level of service um, to inmates as they were re-entering their communities. Next slide. We have a correctional, correctional officer class now currently enrolled um, that is expected to graduate in July. Uh, July. Sorry, thank you. Um, and then we are starting another class right behind it. Um, as many of you remember, uh, a lawsuit filed by the Department of Justice a number of years ago created a situation where we didn't hire a class for about three years. And we are still playing catch up uh, on those vacancies and through natural attrition and also through the fact that we have a cohort of correctional officers who are going to be retirement eligible within a year we are facing a significant staff shortage, and so that's why we're running two classes um, in this year. Director, um, before we, uh, I want to take a pause here on the, on the normal budget before I do that, uh, Chairwoman McQueen. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, I would like to, Mr. Clerk, uh, if you could record that both Senator Lombardi and Senator Quesada are present now. Um, and 
Senator Lombardi, would you like to be recorded in the affirmative on hold for a further study on the seven bills before uh, Judiciary? I would, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. How about uh, you, Senator Quesada, would you like to be recorded in the affirmative? Yes. Thank you very much. It doesn't change the outcome of the vote. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm just gonna, I have a couple questions just in these last few parts, but I'd just like to ask members of the committee um, if you do have any questions on the sort of operational budget um, to either let me know in a minute here or shoot me a text so that I, so that I know you have a question. Um, I, the first question just on uh, slide 11 there related to the reentry and support services. So if I'm following this correctly, we're spending 550000 ish in general revenue. Um, the contract that we had was 583000 um, what's the 79809 in turnover savings like how is it related to this specific investment uh, slide 11 uh, is that just the department's turnover savings that you've been yeah. able to find and you're applying it towards this or yeah that's exactly what it is because okay. we're going to have delay in hiring yep okay um, and then of the there's 112,000 here that's that's saying we could receive Medicaid dollars which did we did we not previously receive a Medicaid match with it being an outside service that's correct that's a new initiative this year where um, the discharge planning will allocate their time in a system to get reimbursed by the federal government we're anticipating that um, we would get reimbursement of 150,000 and then there's some cost to um, with the vendor for this time system so the okay. net would be like 112 okay so if I sort of took the the cost of of the proposal to do these hires of 551 reduced out the 583 and outside services assume 120 of 12,000 net in Medicaid dollars I mean in addition to the other reasons for doing this there's basically 142,000 dollars in savings in totality in this in this area Yes, if, if we, um, if the Medicaid dollars match what we think they're going to come in, and it's yep. unknown at this point because we're not sure how many hours we can capture based on the allocation outlined for Medicaid, depending upon um, if the discharge planners are asking the offenders um, or helping them with applications, discussing um, Medicaid outside of um, the prisons once they get released and other items but because this is our first year it's unknown exactly how much we'll get reimbursed and that's why we dropped it down to that net zero okay um, and then just related to the correctional officer class on slide 12 um, you know certainly um, the number jumps off the page of, of 284 officers um, eligible to retire within a year do we have sort of a you know historical analysis that tells us by you know year folks become eligible at what point do they typically retire and are we are we appropriately matching sort of the expected retirements out with um, these these class sizes I, I'm gonna say um, no for a couple of reasons one is we don't always know um, you know who's gonna avail themselves of, of retirement and who's not um, and there is a there's kind of a weird dynamic with the correctional officer pension system where you can you're eligible to retire but you're not eligible to collect your health care um, and so you can retire at age 55 with 25 years of service um, but you can't get your health care until age 59 so they hang on until at least 59 um, I believe that, that the Brotherhood is, uh, has introduced legislation to, to back that health care number up to age 55 as well, which, which I, I understand, um, but that's going to hurt us uh, even more. Um, the other piece of it is, is that our recruitment, we, don't, um, we used to recruit in years past, uh, and, and not so much recruit, but, but hire to our vacancy or a, or our anticipated vacancy level. Um, frankly, right now, we don't even, we don't have enough people to even do that. Um, like law enforcement nationwide, we are struggling mightily to recruit, um, where we used to get between four and 5,000 applicants, applications uh, for our academies. We now get 1,200 yes. or less. Uh, and so the class that we have currently in session now, class 84, has 22 people in it. 
that's I'm not sure it's unprecedented, but that's crazy low. <laughs> that's very low. Um, you know, just a, just a few years ago, our, our classes were 70 people. Um, and so I'd, I'd love to be able to fill classes that would meet our vacancies or our anticipated vacancies. Um, but, the, but the reality is we are just, we're just struggling to fill classes now. I guess, so I guess my concern there, right, is that, so you, you had a two-part problem, right? One is we need to sort of do our best to predict what the real need's going to be, which I understand there's some complexities, but, you know, we can law of averages, right, try to come up with some sort of a model that does our best at predicting, at least to give us an idea of what to shoot for. And then the second would be the underlying concern that you said, even if we reached that level that we think we need to shoot for, I'm hearing a concern from you that we wouldn't be able to find the candidates, right? So it's almost two different problems, and I guess one way or the other, we've got to figure out how to solve that because otherwise we're going to consistently end up in a position where the department is dramatically understaffed um, and the overtime costs are very high, you know, burnout and turnover is probably going to remain high and just you end up in an endless cycle where you can never, I mean, I've been hearing about this issue for, I think, probably since I've been here between the sheriffs and the correctional officers, right? So. What what are our thoughts there around how do we break this cycle? Um, you know, so, so I guess the first thing is, do we think we can try to model out what we really think is going to be? And then second, what do we have to do to take a step back and, and try to actually fill the vacancies we anticipate? So one thing I can say is that we, we certainly can look at our history in terms of what our attrition rate is and what our vacancy rate has been historically. Um, and that... You know that can be um, that can be uh, a little bit predictive uh, and helpful um, in terms of you know what are we trying to do to to increase the numbers on our um, on our classes? You know our our recruitments have we've been casting as wide a net as humanly possible. We've engaged in a new software program where people can apply via uh, a new, it's just a new way to apply, but it, allow, it, it allows us to cast an even wider net um, than we had been, um, just using all the traditional methods, methods of advertising and so forth. Um, but it's a, it's a problem that is shared not only by the sheriffs and the state police and the Providence police, it's, it's nationwide. The FBI is having trouble recruiting people. Um, law enforcement is, is just, uh, part of it is it's just not a popular place to be right now. Um, and part of it is, you know, um, there, there's, it's a very high stress profession. And so if people can make the same amount of money doing something that's less stressful, they will. Um, and so, you know, we, we're open to anybody that has any other ideas. We have a great training academy, and, and we, I think we do an outstanding job in recruiting people. Um, but it's, it's a struggle that, that is shared by our law enforcement partners nationwide. Yeah, I think, um, I think definitely I would, I'd love to take a look, and if, and if Director Wilmer, if you can kind of put it down as one of our, of our takeaways here, take a look at sort of a predictive model um, of where we think you know, between the classes coming in and the retirements going out, what we think that delta is to recruit for. Um, and then, you know, Director Coyne, to your, to your point there, I 100% I understand the, you know, the, he the, the issue uh, of recruitment. Um, and, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, it's, it's a supply-demand market problem, right? And at the end of the, you know, one way to handle that is, you know, compensation. Um, and it could be, you might do a broader compensation increase, but it might actually save you on the back end if you're reducing your amount of overtime dramatically, right? So, um, you know, I would like us to get out of the box that we're in that we've never been able to solve the problem and figure out, you know, how do we get ourselves out of the box? Because um, I'm not sure it's long-term health um, for the department to continue to be in the circle that I think we've been in for a few years. All right, Senator Acosta. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, and thank you, uh, Director Coyne, for your presentation so far. Uh, Director Moore, can you go back to slide 10? Thank you. So I have a quick question about this and, and, and slide 11. So it sounds from your, your description of these programs that they're, they're still in the, the planning phase, in particular 
the the development of relationships with partners who would be willing to employ some of the folks who would be participating in the apprenticeship program. And so my question around this and somewhat related to what I'll get into on slide 11 is whether or not you would be able to develop a more detailed plan uh, before authorizing the FTEs to carry it out because what it reads like right now is that we're going to hire people to really flesh out the planning stages of this. And so year, this would be year zero of this job, and we'd be throwing a few hundred thousand dollars at, at, at these. Um, and then maybe we'd see some results in, in year one, which would be the next fiscal year. And if you could go to the slide 11, uh, somewhat related to this, um, in slide 11, we talk about bringing the reintegration in-house. and you know, I'll offer that on principle, I'm not a big fan of outsourcing uh, any types of services. I think it's kind of a neoliberal tactic to save money and cut corners. But if if we look at the way that we're moving this money and the, that you identify, which is really turnover in the organization that was responsible for doing this work before, and we're spending just about the same and just doing it in-house, is there any reason to believe that you're... Uh, department would be able to recruit people that were of better quality for the same amount of money to do this work and that you would be able to do it better than the outsourcing uh, organization that was struggling to do the work to begin with. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to um, I'm going to go to your first question first uh, um, about apprenticeship and, and reentry partnerships. I can tell you that there there's already been an awful lot of work done in this area in our department. We received a grant from the Aluminum Foundation last year, the, it might have been the year before. I feel like I lost a year with the pandemic, um, where we could do some planning, uh, a lot of the groundwork in terms of what is the job market, what are the skills that we need people to uh, learn and have to make them competitive when they're released. What we did is we, we took a look at some other states. One state that comes immediately to mind is Iowa. Iowa has an extremely robust apprenticeship program within their facilities, within their prison facilities. And they have a person whose job it is to make sure that those relationships are healthy and, and that they're um, continual uh, and comes up with ways of, of leveraging things like real jobs, um, and employers who are willing to hire uh, uh, prison inmates not only while they're incarcerated, but also after they get out. We don't have anyone like that. I have no staff member. Um, I have a project manager who works on these issues in a, in a kind of a, um, uh, a high level way, but um, no one really who, who, I don't have any staff person who can devote the kind of time uh, and, and resources and, and attention to making it really successful. And that's what I want. I want it to be really successful. And so that's what that apprenticeship FTE is meant to do. It's not that I want the FTE and then I'm going to ask that person to figure out what we should do. Um, we know what we want to do, um, but we just don't have the staff really to do it. Um, and so that's that FTE. The, the DLT FTE, it's, it's for DLT, isn't it? Isn't it? It's ours. Okay, okay. sorry. Um, they, that, that's also a, a connection to DLT, though, even though it would be our FTE, to work with them to, to kind of, so that we're not in these silos, so that we're not just over here trying to find jobs for people, you know. Um, DLT does what they do, and so we want to hook into that, and so we believe that that by having that FTE, because again, I don't have anyone who does that work, who can do that work, um, that that will provide continuity and the ability for us to really give re-entering inmates the best chance of success that they can get. In terms of the, in terms of the other um, slide that you asked about, um, we have recruited and we have hired very high performing um, people to be discharge planners. We've, we've got a, the head of the unit who has decades of experience in probation and parole. Um, we have four discharge planners who have already begun working with our inmate population on all of those reentry issues. Um, and because they have the stability of that state employment, um, it, they're not going to be subject to the 
unfortunate uh, circumstance that that plagues a lot of the the advocacy agencies and the and the vendor agencies that we had dealt with. Um, that is loss of funding. You know, people leaving because they get a better job for more money somewhere else, or and that kind of uh, continual changeover is is just bad for trying to establish a good relationship with the re-entering population and having those handoffs into the community. Um, and so we think that we've already seen that uh, Harvard was right, that it should have come in-house and that it works better that way. Are there any other questions or comments from members of the committee? Okay. All right, let's move on um, to the Article 13 initiatives. Um, Director, I think we're on probably on slide 14. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. So Article 13 of the budget um, it includes a number of pieces uh, that are part of what we're calling a criminal justice reform package. Um, but what I'll do is I'll, go, I'll just go through them. I'm not going to read slides to you. You all know how to read. Um, but I'll just highlight some of the things. And, and in terms of anything related to parole in particular, I know that Chairperson Pizzitaro is on. Um, and so I, you know, I know that she'd be um, better equipped than I to answer specific questions about parole reform. Um, so the first, um, the first uh, square there that says probation reform, this has to do with time off sentence for basically good behavior. Uh, as many of you know, um, inmates within the ACI are, are able to, hey, yeah. uh, inmates within the ACI are able to earn time off their sentence uh, by, by behaving, basically, by not getting in trouble, by not violating our rules. Um, Rhode Island is an outlier nationwide in terms of the length of our probationary terms. We have much, much, much longer terms of probation than most other states in the country. And what that means is it's very difficult for people um, to, to, to move through life and to, to get on with their lives uh, when they are on probation because it impacts their ability to gain employment. It can impact their ability to gain housing. It restricts their ability to travel interstate. Uh, and so forth, and, and, and there's a stigma. Um, and so we believe that part of dealing with that issue uh, has to do with, um, two, it's twofold. One is keeping people who violate their probation in a non-criminal way, and I'll, I'll talk about that more, um, from coming to the ACI, and also allowing people to shave some time off their sentences, their probationary sentences, just as people on the inside can from their incarceration sentences, by following the rules, by doing what they're supposed to do, by reporting to their probation officers, by, you know, trying to uh, uh, maintain employment and so forth. Um, and so that's, that's what the probation reform piece looks like. Um, there is a, a, a section on parole reform that is, is very um, um, parallel. So people on parole, same kind of thing, that they could get credit off their sentences, their parole sentences, um, by complying with the rules, by, by not getting into additional difficulties with the law. Um, there are other pieces to the parole reform package uh, that have to do with the um, expanding the discretion of the board um, and when it comes time to dealing with someone who has violated their parole uh, in order to limit reincarcerating them for, for things that are really technical, what we call technical violations. In other words, not new crimes. Um, there's a piece on compassionate release, uh, which basically is extending our medical parole statute. Uh, and then there's a, a piece having to do with um, allowing juveniles or, or young uh, offenders to be considered for parole um, when they've been given a long sentence prior to age 22. And, and I, can, uh, I can certainly talk more about those, uh, as can Chairperson Pizzitaro. Um, the final uh, square there uh, has to do with two initiatives. One has to do with work release um, and trying to increase our numbers in work release. And one piece of that uh, has to do with changing the formula for the amount of money that inmates who earn money on work release can keep 
uh, and use for their families, for their for themselves. Um, and so we believe that's going to incentivize greater participation in work release. Um, and then there's a, a, a section in the budget article that will expand eligibility for offenders to be considered for classification to home confinement. Right now, people can be held on home confinement as a condition of their bail awaiting trial. They can be sentenced to home confinement as their sentence. Um, and there's a provision in the statute that allows the director of corrections uh, in his or her discretion to classify an offender approaching release to home confinement. The statute right now is extremely restrictive um, and really does not lend itself to any appreciable number of inmates being eligible for that um, possibility or that opportunity. It's never been done. Um, and so this article seeks to remedy that. The next slide is, is all about the, um, the parole um, portions of the article. I don't know if, if anyone has particular questions. Uh, if I can answer them, I will. If, if not, I'll ask Laura to step in. Okay. Yeah, I guess I would just, um, so, yeah, so on, on those, each of those parole reforms, I mean, I don't know, maybe perhaps, you know, Chair Pizzatoro, if you want to maybe step in, just briefly touch on kind of why these four, these four sections are, are beneficial and, and kind of what brought them uh, to us for consideration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and members of the committee, as well as Chairwoman Coyne. So um, I guess a couple of things. I would say from the perspective of, uh, from my perspective, uh, and I want to be careful about speaking on behalf of the board in an advocacy manner. As you know, many of these bills touch on matters that fall within the board's uh, decision making. And so we want to be very careful about, um, you know, offering uh, per se advocacy. However, I will tell you that many of these bills, frankly, codify current parole board practices. The board has engaged in a number of trainings, evidence-based trainings, evidence-based practices over the last six years um, with the National Parole Resource Center, uh, with the Association for Paroling Authorities International, and the Center for Effective Public Policy. And each time we have engaged in training uh, and learned about best practices, we have tried to incorporate them into our guidelines. But our guidelines are just that. They are not mandatory. They are guidelines. Sometimes they change with the makeup of the parole board. And so these proposals are consistent with trends across a number of jurisdictions um, and uh, decisions that have been implemented by the courts across different jurisdictions. Uh, and so they certainly make sense um, with respect to limiting technical revocations you know, under the current statutory scheme, in order to modify a parolee's conditions of parole, a revocation has to occur. Uh, the statute speaks currently uh, with mandatory language that the chairperson shall issue a warrant for any violation of parole. And so I think parole boards across the country are trying to get away from pulling someone in from the community for a technical violation of parole. If we determine that someone who has a substance abuse addiction or someone with mental illness should be granted parole, we shouldn't be surprised if they violate parole with a technical violation, a relapse violation, for example. And so I think it certainly makes sense that this statute would give the parole board uh, discretion to deal with those types of violations in the community with sort of a multidisciplinary approach, right? Pull the parole officer in, uh, have a meeting with the parole chair or the parole board, uh, maybe their service provider, et cetera. And so I think that's where some of these bills go. The earned compliance credit, as Director Coin Fake has pointed out, parallels probation compliance credit. Uh, if someone is earning good time while they're serving their sentence, um, then this would allow them to continue, frankly, to earn good compliance credit um, for behavior on parole as an incentive. 
And we all know positive reinforcement works much better than negative reinforcement. Um, so, I, I mean, I would say overall, those are the sort of my overarching um, summaries and explanation of these bills. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Chair. Do any members of either committee have questions on these parole uh, questions or comments? Okay. Hearing none, Director Coyne. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so the next um, two slides are basically just more of a, a, a level of detail on the, on the uh, overview that I gave. The first one has to do with those compliance credits um, for people on probation. Um, we know that uh, at least 16 other states offer such credits, and we believe that this will assist in shortening probation lengths um, and one of the there's a couple of impacts to that one is it means fewer people coming back to the ACI um, also it, it will allow um, our probation officers to focus their efforts on in supervising the people who need it the most um, so by by reducing their caseloads this way if you will on for people who are following the rules and doing everything they need to do and, and you know, they're still on probation by shortening those people's probations, um, probationary terms, our probation officers will be able to focus their efforts more um, strongly uh, on offenders who aren't doing as well, who need a higher level of supervision. Um, the second um, the, the second piece is, uh, has to do with um, technical violators. So everyone on probation has um, general conditions of probations. Can't break the law, you can't leave the state of Rhode Island, you have to you know, stay out of trouble, that kind of thing. Um, and then there's also um, special um, conditions of probation. Maybe you have to do substance abuse counseling, maybe you have to do batterers intervention counseling if it's a domestic uh, assault uh, case. Those, um, if you fail to do any of those things, it's not a new crime, it's called a technical violation. You've broken the rules of your probation. Um, technical violators uh, who get held uh, at the ACI on those violations um, tend to, to, it tends to start a downward spiral um, because even just a few days in the ACI can lead to someone losing their job, losing their housing, and so forth. And so this, um, this will allow us a, a little more room and provide the courts with a little more, um, I don't want to say guidance, uh, but a little more um, uh, structure in terms of dealing with technical violators who don't present a danger to the community. And to, to the result, hopefully, that those, those people will not be held at the ACI. Um, and so their risk to reoffend, frankly, won't be increased by that short stint at the ACI, but they will stay in the community and probation officers will continue to work with them and hopefully they will be successful. Um, and so that's the, that is the point of, of, that, um, of the, those two pieces of the initiative. Next slide. And the final part, um, nope, back one, thank you. The final part uh, has to do with what, what I mentioned before, work release. Currently, 30% um, of the gross pay uh, for an inmate um, who is on work release is taken right off the top. This will change that to 30% of net. Um, it, 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 it's a really a, kind of a small increase, um, but it's, it's something. Um, and it, allow, it will allow inmates participating in work release to retain more of the money that they earn on work release. Um, we have, I think, a, a, a very good work release program. Um, we want to make improvements to it, but we also want to incentivize more participation in the work release program. And we believe this is one piece to providing that incentive for inmates to want to participate in work release. Uh, the other is, is what I had explained before, that, that um, people who are approaching release um, should be eligible, uh, more people should be eligible for classification to home confinement as they approach release than are currently eligible under the statute. So it makes a, a couple of little tweaks to the statute to provide um, uh, more people to, to be subject to that opportunity. 
and the savings are 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 pretty self-explanatory because they're either people that will not be in our care um, or will have will have more people in the work release program. I did want to say before before I forget um, that the bills, uh, the regular standalone bills that are on for tonight, um, many if not all have uh, at least a direct uh, a direct or or at least an indirect. Uh, impact to some aspects of the Rhode Island Department of Corrections. Um, and so we have provided correspondence to the chairpersons um, on those bills and or have spoken to the sponsors of the bills about our concerns. We did not sign up to testify on any of those bills. I would be happy to answer any questions if any of you have them uh, of us on our position on those bills, but we did not sign up to testify. Okay, Director, thank you um, very much. Let me first ask, uh, do any members of the committees have any questions for Director Coyne on any of the, the budget items or Article uh, 13 items that were presented uh, this evening? Okay. And then hearing none, um, we do have two individuals sign up to testify on the budget, but before we do that, uh, while we have the Director, if Chair Coyne's okay, if any members of the committee have questions on a position in the Department of Corrections, has submitted on any legislation they have coming forward this evening? I don't see any hands raised at this time. Okay. Okay. Thank right. you. We do have two. Thank you so much, Director Coyne, uh, and to Director Romer and, and all of your teams uh, for spending the time with us this evening to bring us through these proposals. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, we do have two individuals signed up to testify, uh, both in support. Uh, of these sections. The first uh, is Steve Brown with the ACLU of Rhode Island. Steve, welcome to uh, both Senate Finance and Senate Judiciary. Uh, thank you, Chair Pearson. Uh, Pearson. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair Coyne. Uh, Stephen Brown from the ACLU of Rhode Island. Um, I'm here to express our organization's very strong support for uh, the various provisions uh, in this budget article. Um, they've been going over well by by the directors. Um, I, I really consider this to be Justice Reinvestment 2.0. Um, uh, the Senate and the House did a great job in 2017 in passing a lot of uh, important reforms, and we see this uh, this article as forwarding those and and um, taking extra steps that will really continue to promote uh, this notion of justice reinvestment. Um, we've submitted de uh, detailed written testimony, so I won't go into all the details, but I do want to uh, briefly talk about the one issue where we do have concerns, and we hope that the committees will amend the budget article to, to address it, and that has to do with uh, provision in Section 3 um, dealing with um, giving uh, early parole eligibility to uh, uh, individuals who committed their crimes while juveniles. Um, I would just note that in past years, uh, the Senate has you know, passed a bill by Senator Metz um, that banned uh, juvenile life without parole, something that 25 other states have done. The way this um, particular budget provision is worded, however, it would authorize juvenile life without parole. A juvenile given any other sentence, including life sentences, five life sentences, they would be eligible for parole after a specified period of time, but the, the legislation as drafted would still allow for this category of life without parole for juveniles. And for all the reasons that this bill attempts to provide um, early eligibility for parole, and it's just eligibility, nobody has guaranteed it, um, but because it recognizes that juveniles should be treated differently, um, we hope that um, the committees will recognize it, recognize that it should apply across the board, and there really should not be this notion of juvenile life without parole. Um, there are dozens of national organizations going across the ideological spectrum that oppose juvenile life without parole from the American Correctional Association, the American Probation and Parole Association, and, uh, and many others that are listed in our testimony. Um, with that one uh, suggestion of uh, what we think is a critical amendment, we really hope this committee will move forward with these very important uh, provisions in the budget article. And with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Steve, for your testimony. Are there any questions or comments from members of the committee? Okay. Hearing none. 
Steve, thank you so much for your testimony this evening. Thank you. Uh, next testify is going to be Michael Delorio, the Rhode Island Public Defender, in support. Michael, welcome to Senate Finance and Judiciary. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, Madam Chairperson. Um, my name is Mike Deloro. I'm an attorney with the Public Defender's Office, and I'm here to lend our strong support to the uh, budget articles that you've been talking about for the last um, last for a while, about an hour or so. Um, I've listened to most of the testimony of uh, Director uh, Coyne Fay, and uh, of course, we're in, we're in strong support of, of the legislation. Um, we did submit extensive written testimony, um, and respectfully, I would direct your attention to that. There's just a couple of high points I uh, would like to jump on, uh, if I can. Um, this legislation is uh, consistent with work that began all the way back in 2016 with justice reinvestment and continued and was enacted in 2017. Um, and it's developed uh, further uh, through 2019 and 2020. What justice reinvestment is about is a sensible reallocation of resources that can enhance public safety, reduce recidivism, and save the state money. And Budget Article 13 does this in a number of different ways, in changes to it'll be made to parole uh, and probation, and it really seeks to address the uh, root causes of criminal um, behavior. Um, and really in looking at it, what it what it does is it attempts to address the real needs of offenders so that they don't uh, can achieve a successful re uh, rehabilitation and reentry into society um, by addressing what their issues are. Um, we did suggest in our um, written testimony a, a change um, on page one line 16 through 18. It's a technical change. Um, really would just make the, the that portion of the legislation would clarify uh, the application of, of that. Um, finally, I'll just conclude by saying that um, in, 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 I was interested to hear um, Director Coyne Fay talking about the prison population and how it was impacted during uh, COVID-19. Um, the it, What this legislation would do in, in many ways would be to continue some of those best practices regarding uh, cases where the police choose not to arrest someone or perhaps to charge the person with a civil violation as opposed to a criminal violation. Uh, judges to act more favorably on um, requests for bail or personal recognizance, just to keep those trends going as we return to uh, normal. And that's what we view this uh, legislation as doing. So with that in mind, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much uh, for your testimony. Are there any questions or comments from members of the committee? Senator Archibald? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mike, I think the technical uh, sentencing violation aspect that we pulled over from the 2016 study is excellent. It gives complete discretion to a judge to be able to give the credits, and they're called conditional. I forget the exact language. I have to scroll back. But you can get those credits. You can have them taken away. It just really gives flexibility, and then you don't have people doing 30 days, 60 days, 90 days to stand at offers on technical violations, and you don't heal the problem. Um, what about this point that Steve Brown just brought up here about, uh, I'm thinking it may just be an oversight. I'm trying to find it. I see juvenile sentencing at the top of the page, and perhaps I should ask Steve, but is that a concern to you that uh, it seems to have language in there on life sentences for juveniles when we've moved away from that? Can, can you amplify on that? Yeah, that's a, great, that's a great question, uh, Senator Archambault. And to be perfectly honest with you, I'm not surprised that you, um, you know, that you're, home, you know, zeroing in on that. You may remember when I testified 
I think it was last week, and mentioned um, in, in reference to Senator Cazada's bill, which was uh, the number is 333, um, that the General Assembly has uh, three different uh, versions of legislation that would address the issue of um, juveniles serving extraordinarily lengthy sentences and who, because of the way in which um, Rhode Island law regarding parole stacks those sentences so that when, for example, a juvenile were to receive a, a life sentence followed by a term of years or even followed by another life sentence, that each of the three pieces of legislation, including the section that you just mentioned, would address that problem. Um, we know that there are a number of juveniles who, you know, committed um, committed offenses uh, prior to their 18th birthday who were waived out of the um, family court to the adult court and are, you know, will not be eligible for parole consideration until they're middle-aged. So we think that for a variety of reasons, there are, you know, you have these three different ways that you can go to do that, and ultimately that's your, um, you know, the decision of the General Assembly. Um, the problem as it exists in Rhode Island is, as we see it, is or are the number of children who are serving these sentences. Uh, thank goodness I can say that Rhode Island has never had a, a, a child sentenced to life without the possibility of parole, even though we have had a series of cases over the years that met the factual predicates for life without parole. Um, we only found one in which the Attorney General even filed a notice of life without parole, and that was a case about 30 years ago. So, uh, yes, it um, is a more civilized and humane approach to say we as a state ought not to be giving children a life without the possibility of parole. Um, and as I said, there are a number of ways to afford relief to this group of children who is serving, who are serving sentences and won't be able to parole until they're 50 or 60 years old. Uh, that was a lengthy and very convoluted answer. I hope I've answered your question. Yeah, Mr. Chair, if I may, yeah, Mike, I, I think you're helping everybody. And I, I have advocated in the same way that you have before, that I have complete faith in the discretion of the of the parole board and Director Pizzatoro and the ability for them, because this is their specialty, to be able to look at an individual. And I think the ancillary bill, uh, just to assuage the concerns mm -hmm. of, of Maximum Lou Raptakis, who I see just joined us, um, I think they I say that affectionately. I think the appropriate bill or the ancillary bill on point has the review for juveniles, what, every 10 years or 15 years? Mm. What, what was it, 10 or was it 15? I can't recall. Yeah, this, well, the one you have in front of you tonight is 10 years. 10 years. And it also it, it recognizes adolescent brain development and the reality of that. Like, I think the age, it, it's not, uh, it goes up to the age 20. I, I don't have the bill in front of me. You, you do, so it may be 21. I'm not sure, um, but whatever it is, so it's different than Senator Casada's bill, and it's different than Representative uh, Casimero's bill. Um, you know, parole, you're absolutely right about the parole board. I have not had the pleasure of practicing before them all that much, but in the few instances where I have, it's an extraordinary group of. A diverse group of people uh, with, uh, yeah, I know uh, Deputy Chief Verdi of the Providence Police was on for a time. Um, there is now another law enforcement officer there. So, yes, we've invested a lot of resources in, in having really, really good people um, on the front line of that. Finally, just let me say, I, I made an offer to last week to meet with uh, Senator Raptakis and anyone else who wanted to talk about these issues, um, you know, privately, because this is, you know, this is complicated stuff. Um, and so I'm happy to meet with you, Senator Raptakis, anyone else who wants to meet to um, answer questions, talk about this further, whatever you like. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. 
Senator Aptakis? Yes, yeah, just uh, to follow up, uh, I did have a conversation for Michael with Senator Archibald to set up a time. We were looking at today where we can, uh, the three of us can discuss to get a mutual time. So that is a okay. very good uh, idea. That, but the only problem, Michael, is to just to put everybody together uh, on a schedule that we can either do a conference call or maybe uh, meet uh, somewhere to start the discussion. Yeah, whatever you like, Senator. I'm, I'm, you know, of course, the idea of getting out of the house and going somewhere is very exciting these days. And uh, uh, so whatever you like, you know, or remotely, whatever you, whatever you think. Thank you so much, Senator, and thank you, Mike. Are there any other questions or comments from members of the committee? Okay. Hearing none, Mike, thank you so much for your testimony and for uh, your time this evening. We appreciate it. You know, you're welcome, uh, Mr. Chairman and Madam Chairperson. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, that does conclude our hearing uh, on uh, House Bill 6122, a.k.a. the budget, uh, for this evening. I want to thank uh, the members of the judiciary for assisting us with that hearing. Um, and I would just like to, you know, ask for uh, all members uh, of both committees, uh, you know, if any issues come up, uh, please do share them as we uh, will be proceeding down the, the budget uh, negotiation path here in, in the coming month or so. Uh, with that, I know there's a series of bills before us uh, next from the Judiciary Committee, so I'll turn it back over to Chairwoman McCoy. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Pearson. It was a very interesting uh, presentation. I appreciate uh, the joint hearing on, uh, on those articles of the budget.